thank you for being here. Uh, I know there are other programs, other sessions going on. And so we do appreciate the fact that you are here spending your time with us. And we want to make sure it's completely worth your time. And um, any questions you have, welcome to ask us. The other thing I want to also mention is that um, after the session, we are available for questions. And after that also, if you uh, want to connect with us on LinkedIn, you're welcome to do that. Send us email, whatever you prefer. Uh, we would love to hear from you and share more of our experience and insights. Given the limited time, we possibly can't cover the whole aspect of our journey, but we'll try to cover the key aspects. But related important aspects, we would love to discuss with you offline as well. We enjoy that kind of collaboration, so no problem at all uh, discussing what, whatever we have to offer and to share with you. So. The discussion today, the conversation today we're going to have is on the idea of business agility and there are many different perspectives, many definitions, many ideas about what it is. Today we're going to discuss from more of an internal aspect which is from our coaching organization's point of view from inside the company and that's an insider look at how this thing actually works, how this thing actually works. So what we're going to, what we're going to try and do is No, my cell phone is over there. Can you turn mic off? Right, can you turn it on later? So, sorry, <laughs> technical problems always here. Demo mode, you try to demo something of a customer, no features work, right? That's the usual thing. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, this journey we're going to discuss is about uh, how we grown as a coaching organization from pretty much one person or two people to uh, a decent number of people and the impact we've had on the larger organization over time. Uh, so the topic is the key to sustaining true business agility and one of the keys to that aspect is a robust coaching organization. Many companies don't invest as much or they under invest or they don't invest at all in coaches. The value of coaches is realized only after a lot of damage has been done and luckily we realized early on the value and the importance of having good coaches and we invested in it pretty well and so the results are what you're going to see today. Uh, not that we have accomplished anything great, but uh, comparatively where we were to where we are now, it's much better. So over time, our journey is just even more promising and we hope to achieve even bigger and better things. So we'll start with just an introductions um, about me and then my colleague Lakshman will introduce himself and the company as well. Uh, so that's me and those are my, our three dogs. Uh, we love our dogs. So I want the pictures everywhere. A <laughs> uh, little bit about me. So my current title is Head of Academy and Agile Practice at um, IHS Market. So Academy is a learning and development platform that we are trying to create in our company. And this is something that will touch um, all of our employees, close to 16,000 people, right? So my goal, I just took over this role a couple of weeks ago. And so my vision is to make sure everybody is a teacher, everybody is a learner, right? Teaching each other, sustainably growing our learning organization. <coughs> I also have the second work stream which I'm responsible for, which I have been responsible for for the past five and a half years, is the Agile Practice Area. And that's something I'm very passionate about uh, and I've been researching a lot, working on this area for a, lot, for a while. Um, by background, I'm an engineer, software engineer, and I still code. I still enjoy coding, uh, something fun for me. Uh, also, I, I'm put on different hats, coach, trainer, mentor for people. Um, I serve a global team of servant leaders, which is people that are both agile coaches, as well as now the new stream of learning and development um, organization type of people as well. So my idea is to envision and strategize on how do you grow and mature a company? How do you grow in an agile, in, in agile fashion, business practices, processes, and how do you grow people to be the best they can be? My ultimate goal is to make things better, right? Things should be better today than they were yesterday. Things should always get better. And so how do we instill this idea, this mindset of continuous improvement? That's our focus. And my personal beliefs are, are animal welfare, animal rights, and animal liberation. And I enjoy photography, uh, nonfiction books. I tend to read. Um, to develop myself, develop my knowledge as well. Thank you, Anil, and my name is Rick. Um, good evening, all. Uh, I'm Lakshman Larimal Vekpati. I'm the principal. principal Agile coach for Bangalore location. Along with Bangalore, I take care of India team's Agile initiatives. I have 14 years experience, and in Agile journey, I've been working from past four to five years. Those are my kids. And I came from software background, and predominantly I work with Bangalore Center. My main responsibilities are working with teams, individuals, transformation, coaching, mentorship, and my hobbies are parenting. 
after kids i don't have anything to make hobby so parenting is one of my important hobby yeah from there i'd like to share our agenda as shesh mentioned we'd like to make more interesting the rest of 30 minutes here is our agenda we are going to talk about ihs market already we got some questions who ihs market what they do we'll try to share what is exactly ihs market and then we are going to talk about our interesting agile transformation journey how we started what kind of challenges and then uh, the important point we are going to talk about how we are accelerating and sustaining our business agility we have been doing it and we are going to share how we did it how we are going to do it the next as usual the success stories and we are going to share some of the key challenges which we have experienced in our journey about ihs market yeah ihs market is uh, headquarters is in london we are data information company founded in 1959 the main business areas information science and data we serve to 50000 customers across the globe right uh, in 2016 we merged with a company called market so now we are ihs market so the goal is to match with the company is to create a data powerhouse right that's all mainly about ihs and who we serve we serve maritime defense financial services energy ultimately we try to provide data to the companies to take critical decisions in their day to day activities that's about ihs thank you lakshman there's a couple of things i would like for you to remember if you can please the, the first thing i want you to remember um, for most of you most of us numbers are sometimes easy to remember especially uh, money so if you remember this number the second thing i want you to remember is this definition right so just so we have a common understanding of what is business agility uh, from our point of view at least uh, so we know the context of what we're discussing so first it's the ability of anything not just a business anything i guess in this case is business agility so it's business to respond to changes as fast as rapidly as possible but it's actually better to create change than to be swept away by it or be a part of it if you are able to you know, create change evoke change make change happen you are the leader rather than be a follower the second thing is that change can be of two types internal external internal could be you have people leaving the company key execs leaving the company internal politics internal warfare um, those empire building and those sort of things external things are things like um, politics outside uh, warfare uh, outside um, and key market shaping things like technology have changed or or people have customer preferences have changed there's disruption going on this all external changes but the key aspect of business agility is to do all of this without losing momentum or vision these are the two key things if you lose momentum people get bored or people lose faith if you lose vision people lose trust so both momentum and vision have to be preserved while you're pivoting and and doing whatever changes you got to make which makes it really really challenging right this is why when people use the word agility it's used very loosely and with with just a lot of lightness to it in reality it's a really dense and a very heavy and a serious matter right so we have to treat it with the respect that it deserves so agility is not something to be tossed about lightly it's a very important and very critical part of how businesses survive and thrive as well yeah it's time for you we would like to have a quick survey with all of you the first question how many of you have strong coaching organization or set of qualified coaches in your organization show hands please The next one how many of you have don't have a strong coaching organization and plan to have it so i'll go back to the first question so what made you to create a strong coaching organization would like to hear your thoughts so the purpose right anyone else so good that we have seen some strong sense to create a great coaching organization and definitely the rest of the journey will connect you we hope that 
Thank you, uh, thanks, Shman. Thank you for sharing your thoughts as well. So at this point, we want to kind of start off on how we started uh, our journey. And this was back in um, kind of 2013, a little bit maybe before 2013, but primarily around 2013 time is when we started focusing on how do we actually make this a proper agile organization. So this was a legacy IHS back then. Merger was in 2016, as Lakshman mentioned. So until then, it was uh, just purely IHS. So about 1,200 R&D colleagues, our focus was R&D, software development, you know, those kind of people. Um, but we had challenges as we began. Example, we had a mix of AUP and waterfall. Uh, waterfall is agile, agile is waterfall, whatever you want to call it. We also had a PMO uh, that was in place. And so they had, there were some processes and those sort of things that could have been, that was actually a challenge. Uh, we continue to have this challenge, which is multiple siloed business lines. Most businesses have this problem, right? These silos that exist. We also have them and we had them. We will probably continue to have them as well. Uh, global presence, considering we were about seven, 8,000 people back then, um, but about 10, 11,000. Global teams are just a fact of reality. We just, that those just exist, you can't do anything about it. And so those dispersed teams cause a lot of, lot of problems sometimes, right? You have disconnect, uh, time zone problems, communication issues, cultural problems, and so on and so forth. So we had those, have those, and probably <coughs> will continue to have those also because we are a larger organization we were, we are now than we were just even two years ago, right? We are close to 16,000 people from 11,000 back then. And these are the eternal things. Mindset and cultural issues are another source of challenge that will you will encounter constantly. Um, there is always the, the top layer that wants things done, the bottom layer that absolutely would love to do that, and then you have this middle layer, right? That's always the source of resistance, the source of uh, usually uh, much of the misery and malaise in most companies. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we also had. And there's cultural issues about change, about entrenched beliefs and how things should be done and why things should not be this way. Every organization, we, each individual has it. A company is just a group of individuals, right? So if individuals have it, the company has it. So we encountered those sort of things also. I'm not saying these things have disappeared. These things, the first one has gone away. Second one, we're working on breaking. Third one, reality can't do much about it. Fourth one, we are actively working on. So we have control over certain things. We don't have control over certain other things. The key is to know the difference and do the right thing about what we have control over. Make sure you improve it. What we don't have control over, figure out a way to get control. Right? Those sort of things. So I think this is where a lot of our challenges were. And the initial outcome, when we started the legacy IHS transformation, uh, we call it phase one, or, or <laughs> the initial aspect was the pre-merger with, with market. And we started seeing um, some good, strong success. And the curiosity was for us, from the, for at least for me and some of the coaches in, in, in my company, what is the reason for the success that we are seeing, right? So we started sending out um, questionnaires to people. Like, how did we know? We sent out surveys to people. Um, what makes you happy? Is the process working for you? What are you missing? Okay. What, are you, what are you liking? What are you not liking? Do you need more training? Do you need more coaching? What's making you successful? So we sent out these quarterly surveys. We sent out these quarterly surveys to people and started getting feedback from them. So we started noticing a good positive trend in the way people were looking at the process. They were much happier in many, many ways. The second thing was increase in quality. Quality of products went up. Um, there were better techniques to do prioritization, backlog grooming, those sort of things. And so people started focusing more on the product itself, more customer focused. And the third thing was a sense of teamness, which was not present before. It was just everybody had some expertise, they were expected to contribute in that area. But as an agile team, as feature teams, everybody had something at stake and they all had to rely on each other. So we had this sense of teamness emerge slowly over time. And that was a strong bonding experience for a lot of people. When you do daily stand-ups every day, right? when you talk to each other, you're forced to talk to each other every day at least for 15 minutes. Or when you do, sit as a group and do iteration planning or release planning uh, or any of these exercises, you're actually talking to each other as human beings too, right? not just as stakeholders or whatever. Those interactions prove pretty valuable over time. I think that led to a, a sense of we are all in this together. We are all doing this together. Right? That helped a lot. And one of the key aspects actually, which is um, not very well represented, <coughs> is the idea of this healthy tension between business and pd and right, or R&D. Uh, business folks want everything done two days ago, right? R&D says, well, it'll take us 10 more years to get it done. So we have this really weird tension between business and R&D. What we started seeing, though, is the level of engagement 
with business started going up because of all these sessions, all these agile practices we were putting in place, they started to connect more with us. Okay, what do customers really want? Not what I want, what do customers really want? And so customer centeredness started taking root to some extent and the skill levels of product owners and product managers started going up. That resulted in more engaged teams. As a result, we started seeing more and more engagement over time. Um, that being said, I'm not saying this problem has been solved yet. In There are silos, as I mentioned, some silos are more successful than others, right? And the reasons for it, we'll, we can get into offline as well. I'm very happy to discuss those with you. Um, actually, you want to talk about it? Yeah. Thank you. So having that success, I would like to share some of the factors which are really helping us to get the success. The first one is, yeah, leadership support. We always talk about leadership support, but in IHS market, to get the success, definitely we are getting and we got some great leadership support. It starts from CTO and and uh, CEO and CPO, that is Chief People Officer. So there is a great leadership support to do our agile initiatives and the continuous clear messaging about agile. You know, our journey, it's been almost six years, but the message and momentum is continued in this organization. Next, always, we need to start things with the teams. We have, after our first phase, we have some teams who are really enthusiastic to start their journey. Without strong teams, we can't get our agile outcome. And having this first phase of transformation, uh, team's mindset changed from practices to agile culture. We always say doing and being. Uh, we are not ready to use that, but still, the mindset definitely changed. Everybody started thinking that they wanted to change something to achieve great results. Community. This is one of the key factors for our success. When we start our journey, we started our community of practices. It can be teams, it can be SharePoint portals, internal communities. These communities are really helping us to continue the momentum and help people when they get challenges on their transformation journey. And the last one is always important. We wanted to show the difference between leadership support and leadership involvement. If you look at here, that's leadership involvement. We have a mid-level leadership teams are involving in our agile journey they wanted to you know, make dirty their hands as part of the transformation. It's not that giving instructions change from command and control to the collaborative leadership. They are part of our transformation so that they can understand the real challenges which really help us to get the outcome. Yeah, we wanted to highlight the challenges in the journey. Still the challenges are there and some of the challenges have existed and some of the challenges are going to be our continuous journey. So we don't want to dot our challenges because Challenges definitely give an opportunity for Agile coaching team. Yeah, mindset, we would like to give some different defi definition on mindset from our organization. When we say mindset, everybody talks about agility, but as a team, the culture is not coming along with the team members. When we talk to individuals, definitely everybody try to implement agility, but as a team, we were seeing a challenges. That's what one of the mindset challenges, part of the teams. Silos. Yes, as Shesh mentioned, we were trying to fix some of the challenges, but still there are silos within development teams, within business teams, business and development, especially dev and ITs. Every department, line of business works as an individual organization. Everybody has their own expectations, goals, which are not meeting to the organization goals. Scaling, we have 16,000 colleagues and scaling is always a challenge, right? But what we are doing, we are creating this self-sustaining team, self-reliance teams to scale our agile mindset to rest of the organization. That's what our journey. We are going to talk about some numbers, how much we scale and what is our future plan to scale entire organization. Yeah, as usual, funding and budgeting, we as the agile team, agile coaching team in IHS, definitely we do have some budget and funding issues to travel to different locations. Since ours is a small team and we need to cross across organization, the scaling of 16,000 people, we need to travel, and funding is one of the biggest challenge for us to transform agility into the organization. Yeah, this is an important team. We always talk about agile is always co-located teams, but in reality, the challenge is, this is dispersed teams, remote teams, and you know, co-located remote teams. Being, being in India, we have teams in different locations. Every team has their own agile, objectives. So always this is a big challenge for us to get them everyone into common mindset. 
So we'll continue on with phase two and what was phase two, what did phase two look like? As I mentioned, we had the pre-IHS market merger and then the post-IHS market merger phase. So this is phase two, we'll kind of talk about and see what, what happens here. So as we gained momentum and we started seeing that things were taking root, we wanted to continue that and, and somehow exponentially increase it if possible. To maintain that momentum, we realized we needed um, agile coaches and we needed agile coaches to actually make it happen. So to do that, we had to build a team. So what was the purpose? What did we hope to achieve, right? The first thing was we wanted to make sure the culture of agility was preserved everywhere. So to make sure that the coaches are able to uh, in, in infect others with this idea that, hey, this is a real thing. This will give you real benefits. The second thing we talked about this a few times is mindset. This is hugely important. And you'll see us repeating this because if you don't have this, practices mean nothing, right? Those are just rituals. They mean nothing. If you have the right attitude, then practices are not as important. You'll get the job done, right? But this is the core and critical aspect, which is why we keep emphasizing it. If you are facing this problem in your organization that you're bringing in people, coaches, qualified people, and you're still having trouble getting momentum going, getting traction in your, in your journey, more than likely it's a problem of mindset or just politics or those sort of things like that, um, cultural issues. So you have to focus a little bit there more than anything else, not necessarily on practices. And the third thing is we realized people needed access to high quality content, training, coaching. And so we as a team started working on good content. Um, so whether it's training product owners or training agile fundamentals, training scrum masters, training leaders, uh, we as a team of coaches started working on content. How do we deliver the best possible information in the best possible way that's absorbing, that's, that's interesting, but it's also very impactful to how they understand Agile. So how did we go about creating this Agile organization? Our primary thing was we are very selective in how we interview people and how we get people into the organization. And this is a very, very important aspect. A um, lot of companies try to just fill some position with somebody in the hopes that, you know, maybe the budget won't get taken away if they don't fill, right? There's these pressures on, on budget. Uh, but we were patient about it. We said, if we don't get the right person, we won't fill that spot. As an example, I had a position open in Aberdeen for like nine months. Nine months, it was open. I couldn't fill it. We just closed it. Rather than fill it with somebody we could have dealt with, we just decided to close it. There's no point, right? So we have sometimes those kind of challenges. We can't source good people. So we're very selective in who we hire. So interview process is extremely, extremely rigid. And it's very, um, I won't say difficult, challenging might be one way to put it. Uh, we send out an exam for people to take, and after, the, after they take the test, we look at the results. And then, if you like what we see, then we get the person in for a phone interview. We work through the results with them on the phone. If you like them there, then we get them on site. Um, so it, it's not, out of 50 people, or 100 resumes maybe we got for one position, we had one on site interview, right? So it's very challenging to get in. We want to make sure we attract only the absolute best people who really mean what they want to do, which is, uh, do they intend on making this change happen? Are they serious about Agile? Do they really personify the aspects of Agility? So it's kind of difficult to find these kind of people. So we can't just fill anybody right, in that position, So which is why it's very difficult. So as the, one of the things we wanted to make sure was, first of all, it's insourced, which is making sure that we're not hiring temporary people, contractors, consultants. It's got to be people with skin in the game. They have to be part of the company, full-time employees. No options, no excuses, no exceptions. 100% part of the company. That's our goal, right? Second thing is to build a community. That was one of the aspects, uh, aims and objectives of the coaches is, was to create a community, right? That was a necessary aspect of it. All the coaches have to have their own community. And while creating this org, we are also focused on the ROI. How do we know these coaches will actually give us the benefit? This is hugely important. Most people ignore it. Oh, they'll just come in, do daily stand-ups, do some training. That's not where you get your value from, right? Value derives from their ability to influence you to make the right choices, present to you multiple options so you can pick the right one, to coach you and to help you help guide you to the right path. Right? That's where value comes from. So we need to make sure we have the right ROI for it. What benefits do, do we derive other than just somebody coming in and running our um, rituals and ceremonies for us? It's got to be much beyond that. Right? And finally, we have to be entirely self-sufficient, which means every coach on our team is expected to come up with high quality content for their own training. And then we, as a group together, we, we look at the content and we provide feedback and we get you know, improvements done. But every coach is expected to also submit proposals to conferences. 
uh, last year, for example, out of five people who submitted proposals, four got through to major conferences, including Agile Alliance, uh, where was it, in San Diego, I think, last year. And, uh, and three other people got into Mile High Agile and Agile Gaming Conference. So we have those kind of people who are completely committed and very, very high quality, very competent people. And it's not easy finding those people, by the way, and they're not cheap either, right? They're pretty expensive people, but they're worth it, worth every single cent, right? So as a team, we also wanted to have a vision. You can't just put a bunch of people together and say, okay, now do this stuff. They may do it, but they won't do it well. You need a purpose. You need a common purpose. And the common purpose comes from a vision statement. So I charged the team with coming up with a vision statement. Develop a vision statement that you, th that you feel best represents the purpose behind the work that you do. So here's the statement we came up with as a team, right? So the point was not just agility, but a culture of agility. A culture that permeates the entire organization, not just one or two silos or aspects. We achieved that culture of agility through coaching, which is the primary weapon every coach has is coaching, right? That's the main arm, main ammo. Then through mentoring people, long-term work development of people, the mentoring, training people, of course, is one key aspect. You can't ignore that. And one of the key aspects was communities of practice. So I started this community of practice in July 2013 when I first started taking part in um, the transformation. It's still going strong. It's going to be six years now. Still going strong. We still meet every month. We still have great conversations. We meet on Teams and SharePoint and other sources. Still have great discussions, right? We continue that momentum even now. But the key to doing all that is ultimately you want customer value. It's okay to do all this, but if you produce something nobody wants, what's the point? Ultimately, it must deliver superior, high quality customer value that customers can buy into. And, and, and be thankful for, to us for, and we have long-term partnership with them. Thank you. Yeah, having a great vision, now I'm going to talk about some numbers, right? We always want to see numbers, because without data, people can think it's an opinion, right? So I know everybody's expecting to see the numbers, so I got an opportunity to share the numbers, right? Again, as I mentioned, this is Agile Coaching Transformation Team. 2,000 is a number. Yes. As of today, we have coached, trained, transformed 2,000 people in these subject areas. One is Agile Culture and Mindset. Second one is Scrum Framework, which is most popular. Everybody wants to try with the Scrum, where people can customize based on their needs. But our main focus is starts with the famous framework. Next, product ownership with the business people. And the fourth one is, which we start recently, that's called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. I know most of them know about this, which is so popular nowadays in the market, about objective setting system. It's not a performance system, but objective setting system. We strongly believe that strong OKR systems are very important to, to get the agility into the teams, because the good objectives will drive people to change their mindset. The next two. We are creating self-sufficient teams, self-reliance teams, with help of coaching strong scrum masters and product ownerships. If you look at IHS market coaching model, we wanted to build internal scrum masters, internal product owners in each and every team. Being a product-based company, we want to create these powerful roles within the teams. We call it as aspiring scrum masters and agile product owners. The last one is important. If you want to continue the momentum, if you want to continue your journey, the community of practices are very important. Along with the community of practices, change agents. Having 16,000 colleagues in the organization, we as a coaching team, six people. Scaling is always a challenge. So what we are doing and what we did, we create community of practices, local guilds, chapters to create change agents. Change agents. Today, if you look at our change agent number, 560 people are part of our communities who are really helping us to drive our initiatives. They're acting as a change agents. They're sharing some of our responsibilities. They're helping us to continue the momentum within the organization. Thank you, Lakshman. So this might give you some context on where we are today. We talked about the initial journey and some challenges, but where are we today, right? What are we doing right now? Um, one of the things, an interesting thing is, we are starting to work with sales. Uh, which is interesting, right? Uh, when you think of sales, you don't think agile. You think fixed things, you know, fixed ways of doing things, uh, be at the golf club at 3 p.m., <laughs> those sort of things. Uh, but sales, we are actually starting to work with our sales folks to inject the idea of agile in sales. That's a, that is a concept called agile selling, agile sales. So I'm kind of partnering with some of the VPs in different um, geographies 
to start this idea of agile sales. And so there's some uh, reasoning behind it. The response has been very positive, but it's a very new initiative. It's brand new, and so it takes some time to get traction. But there's a lot of promise, a lot of potential in this area. So that's one thing we are focusing on. The second thing is our partnering, continuing to partner with business folks. Um, in most organizations, product management seems to be source of a lot of the, the misery, not of their own making. It's just that they have emerged from a pool of SMEs, right, or somebody uh, who are business analysts. A lot of them are not classically trained in business. They don't really understand the fundamentals of business. So many of them are just, like I said, product experts who have kind of gotten promoted because there's nobody else to do the job. So you don't find classically trained product owners and product managers, which is part of the problem. And so that's what we're trying to fix by partnering with them, working with them, coaching them, training them with better techniques, better tools, better mindset, better, better application of their ideas. And that's where we're starting to see significant traction especially uh, you know, with the merger of the market, uh, we are starting to see different parts of the, the market uh, um, uh, wing come together and say, yeah, this is great. How do we do this stuff? So we're seeing more and more engagement there. We also are working with HR very closely. Uh, I was in Singapore, Malaysia um, last year, and I was working with our HR folks on their onboarding and offboarding processes. So the way they have structured it was kind of waterfallish, but uh, having worked with them, we are introducing lean concepts value stream mapping, those sort of things. And in a very, very short time, these are exceptionally you know, intelligent people. They understood the point of it. And our chief people officer is a huge believer in Agile and Lean. And so he's fully behind it. That helped also to get some momentum between, uh, behind it. And as a result, our HR folks are now actually talking Agile language. You know, What's the sprint? You know, how do we do this? How do we break this thing down? What, is, what should a roadmap look like? So this is pretty unexpected you know, in any company. Forget one the size of you know what we have, 16,000 people, but our HR organization is getting increasingly focused on being more agile, which is a really, really gratifying thing to see. It makes you really feel proud of the work you've done. Um, our bread and butter happens to be, continues to be R&D, people that <laughs> produce software, that's our key thing, and that still continues to be a focus, because if we acquire a company, for example, then that becomes part of our ecosystem. So we have to focus on them as well. Ultimately, we are a product organization. We must focus on the technical aspects as well, like DevOps and those sort of things. And customer care is another area, underappreciated, undervalued, under understood, okay. And just people don't get customer care. They think, well, these people are at the forefront of uh, getting calls from customers who are not happy. You can pick up the phone, talk to a happy customer. It's easy to do that. But to pick up the phone and talk to an unhappy customer, that's not easy, right? But the critical insights usually come from unhappy customers. So what we started doing is working closely with our customer care folks and bringing them into the Agile ecosystem. And so every month we have two calls uh, with our customer care, our product owners, with our dev folks together and our leadership to understand what are, the, what are the most recent challenges? What can we do to help this, this, and this? As a result, we've seen strong engagement from product owners also. This is another way we are boosting, uh, boosting agility across the company. Um, the next few things are even more interesting. These are more of recent developments. As we continue to do this, the primary thing is Academy, which I just mentioned uh, took over a couple of weeks ago. The platform is of learning and development, coaching, learning, training each other. That's one of the angles we are, we are, trying, to, we are trying to get through to. Building upon that are two things, two key components. One is called great teams. Great teams is a great concept, which is um, how do you create high-performing teams? That is an internal program we developed. And as part of Academy, we are rolling it out. In fact, I just delivered this training um, yesterday to our Bangalore folks. And I'm off to Delhi next week to do the same thing there as well. So this is one thing we're trying to introduce to, to people. How do you create high-performing teams? Second thing is OKRs, as Lakshman mentioned earlier. Alignment and transparency are absolutely critical in getting anything done. If you don't have alignment or transparency, you're going to have a problem. So OKRs ensures that. That's another way to boost your business agility. So we also act as OKR coaches for the organization. We taken upon that responsibility even though it wasn't formally given to us. We felt there was a gap, so we took it. Right? That's another way, uh, another thing we are working on as well. I hope this is going to be another interesting slide. I'm not sure how many are, are you doing coaching job, but we strongly believe and feel that coaching is a thankless job most of the time. At least I've experienced in my journey, in my five years of journey, right? But Considering those things in IHS market, what we did, we give thanks back to the coaching organization. Not only to the thanks, we need to empower coaching organization first to continue our journey. Glad I'm part of that coaching organization. So what we do to empower our coaching organization? 
roles and responsibilities, right? We call it as a core responsibilities. When we hire any coach, they'll have their core responsibilities. But the good part is the core responsibilities are written by coaches within our organization. They have written they them themselves what are their core responsibilities to achieve the business agility. We have strong core responsibilities starting from associate scrum masters to enterprise coaches. And the next is career path. Custom career path is very important thing. If you start journey in IHS market, your role will not be end only by coach. Definitely that's an empowerment. So our career path is which is equivalent to leadership roles. If you take any coach, their career path, which is equivalent to role, and they got an opportunity to work with leadership teams, and they'll be part of the decision making any project roadmaps. It's not just end with the coach. I've seen most of the times coaches are mainly focused on coaching and transforming. But in our organization, coaches are part of decision making, and they're part of the leadership team. Thank you, Lakshman. A couple of success stories we want to share. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, so we'll try to cover this a little bit quicker. Um, first thing, what was the number we showed on the screen? Do you remember? 1.5 million, right? Yeah. Nice. So everybody remembers money. <laughs> so um, that money, that amount is the amount we saved our company by keeping everything internal. That's over a very short period of time. And it's, uh, it's obviously increasing. The savings are increasing. That's just a raw number that looks at the training. We haven't even looked at the benefits of the coaching aspect we've done, the resultant value. I've not even counted that. That's much, much, many, many times over. Um, so one of the things we did was there's a, a group in market, um, Boulder, Colorado. We had 440 people needed to be transformed. We made it an internal effort rather than having them go to an outside agency. We, I deputed somebody on my team to go and spend six months with the team, and that one person on my team transformed 440 people. Now they look at things like agile contracts, which was something nobody had even thought of before, right? So agile contracts and those sort of things are now <coughs> taking root in, in that area. Second thing, we used to have deployment of products that used to be a cycle of 1.5 years to two years. We brought it down to three months. That's the second big victory we had in terms of speeding up the process of releasing uh, products. And in one case, we used DevOps to reduce cycle time of delivery from almost a week to three hours, right? So these are the real examples of how we were able to do some of these things. I mentioned about HR, which um, we already heard. Um, I brought, you want to talk about the election? Yeah, we would like to spend some time about uh, one of the transformation model which we created in Bangalore, which I'm heading. So we name it as Updraft. So I'd like to tell a small story in a minute. So before we start Updraft, we were following Agile. We were following retrospectives. We were following all the ceremonies. We were able to release, but something was missing, which everybody thinks. So what we identified, the teamness, right? So we understood if we want to start our agile journey, first we need to create a teams which are really having a great mindset. I hope most of the times we miss that important act part and we try to transform, we try to coach or train people. So I'll just quick through, uh, quickly go through. Basically our main motive of creating a draft is transform teams from augmentation mode to autonomous. We always talk about autonomous, but which we try to create in our teams. That's a simple difference. And I'm happy to say this is not a rocket science. Everybody can do it. Only thing is we put some efforts to create a team which can start their agile journey. If you look at this was our team structure, the business requirement, product management, product capabilities, which were in part of global. And if you look at our Bangalore teams, India colleagues in Bangalore teams, most of the times we used to have development folks and SQA folks they used to get requirements in a task mode. And when we do interview with the teams, they're not having a clear picture of business requirements. They used to try to get the task and finish to send it. That was the biggest part we focused. And then we, we try to create a strong local leadership in every team so that they can take care of building a great teams. That's our second phase. And ultimately, the aim of this model is to create an abdraft team. What is abdraft team? Abdraft, the meaning of abdraft is abdraft is a dread of air and add some fuel or current or fire to the teams to come to the next level where you are expecting. If you look at this is the ideal abdraft team model and we want product owners, scrum masters, local leadership has to be in same location. Abdraft is not outsourcing program to take job from somewhere, but wherever the team is there, wherever the team you call as an agile team, create strong roles in a co-located team. 
there are three pillars to create abref teams yeah anybody can create a team but the fuel of this abref team is the first one is the model team whatever the model we have created every team has to follow that model to start their journey and the second one the important one strong agile local leadership we don't want command control we want strong agile local leadership to follow the model which we have created and finally the third one important one which always we expect to get it the global leadership support for us it's a global leadership support for others it can be executive leadership support the, we need a support from top to execute what we have drafted as a team model so these are the three pillars which are helping us to create great teams if you look at our journey in our portfolio we have almost transformed to six to seven teams in this model we're getting a good results thank you lakshman um, in summary right it was exactly perfectly on time actually so in summary some of the takeaways i want to share with you are, are, are a few key things one if you are looking to really share your um, accelerate your business agility there are many, many factors in, involved in it. The specific aspect we're looking at today is, as I mentioned, from an internal point of view, from a coaching organization's point of view, it's well worth your time to invest the time, the effort, and the money to create a strong organization. But there are a few things you must keep in mind. Number one, it must be well supported. It has to have strong level of support. It has to be independent, autonomous. You can't have it reporting to the people that make the key decisions on how this team will operate. Right? You want them kind of separate from that. You want them to be totally impartial. They must be strongly competent. Your interview processes must be very rigid, very difficult to get through. You must find the right people, and so they, it, it should be rewarding for them to get through. It can't be simple for them to get through, right? You want to make sure you find the right people, and sometimes finding the right people is not easy. So invest that time, develop a test plan, make sure that you find the right people by administering good tests, high quality tests, right? They must be charged with a clear purpose. If they don't have a clear vision on what they need to accomplish, it's not going anywhere. Right. Make sure they charge with a clear purpose. This is hugely important. This is what binds them together to do bigger things than what any one of them could do. Right. Finally, they must be completely autonomous. Right now, we are entirely autonomous. There's nobody from any organization that can tell us what to do or how to do it. We figure our own path. We know what to do and how we decide amongst our team what the right thing to do is. And we test it. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, let's revise it. Right. So these four things, I think, are, are absolutely valuable. So you can think of, think of them as guidelines to create your own uh, specific organization. Uh, with that, we'd like to um, stop and, and ask um, if you have any questions you'd like to. Yes, yes. And also mentioned that what everybody Yes, yes. So how does that work in a Yes, we had. Good question. The connecting question. We have one product. We have teams in four locations. Within India, we have three locations. So for India, what we did, we created local leadership in Bangalore. At least you can coverage. But other locations, global locations, we, have, we do have people leaders there. But we are building team leads as a leadership role. Right? It's all happening internal. No, no, we are not. Th that, that care we... No, it empowering one of the person to take a Excellent yes. point, but yes. it depends. Some teams, we are always trying to give opportunity for the existing members, existing members. But if you don't get a right skill set on leadership, definitely we have to go for hire. It depends on the team dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the mindset, right? It so is. And, and, and it's not just the right coach, mm -hmm. which is the ultimate people talking about aspects of education, but Absolutely. have the HR, when you said, I think it's a success, you went with the HR as a result. So do they extend the same concept when hiring professionals for teams to determine teams who are? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, and true, we are actually working on our interview processes to strengthen those aspects also. Uh, I'm actually actively working with multiple silos uh, that we have to ensure our interview processes are more consistent now. And we are focused heavily on the agile aspect. In fact, many um, people we rejected because their responses were so command and control type, we knew they were not just a good fit at all. So to answer the question, yes, it's not just the agile coaches. It's a good beginning. But across the organization also, we emphasize heavily 
this mindset that we require of them. And that's growing across. Great question. Thank you. Uh, and to, to add to that point, uh, recently we started involving Scrum Masters, Agile coaches in interview panel also. Right? Yeah. It's not, it's, it's a mo mandate, but wherever required, on a final round, these coaches are going and you know, checking their mindset, whether they'll fit into the organization. A question there, sir? So OKRs is one way to look at how the team accomplishes something, right? Um, so that's a great question. So two aspects to that. One is that performance management traditionally has been broken. Right? People usually look at it as individual, what have you done? What have you done? Uh, what has the team done, though? Right? So OKRs is a way to extract the best performance out of a team, because you're giving them a common cause, a common purpose to, to work on. But in that, you cannot forget the individual component either. Right? There are some people who pull their weight, some people that don't. So that requires coaching. So OKRs is great. It's a great way to look at the team measurement, but individually, you have to still have to coach people who are underperformers. And to do that, we look, we look at 12 or 15 different factors. Initiative, leadership, uh, creativity, innovation, risk taking, competency, skills. How do you grow yourself? How do you learn? How do you develop yourself? What's your level of maturity? A thousand different things, right? They all go in too. So performance management right now is two ways. One, OKRs as a team. Second, individual contribution to that initiative. Yes, very, very frequent. Every quarter, every quarter we have reviews about oh, for everybody. And actually, we are. My personal belief is that we should move from quarterly to continuous performance. Every single day, let's look at what's good and what's not good. Sorry, go ahead. You do it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll start off. Um, so number one, I mentioned the autonomous aspect. Autonomy is a key aspect. Because our organization is independent of all of those pressures, we can make decisions that usually you cannot. We can challenge our leaders directly and tell them what's broken, whereas traditionally you couldn't do that. For example, let's say you're a coach, sir, and you report into uh, the person that hired you, and they are running a team of people that does software development. It's hard for you to question them, because they are your boss. So we traditionally chose not to have that. Uh, and we try to keep our people independent. Even if I get pressure, that pressure is not going to go to my team. I push back right away. My team is always protected from that. They can make whatever choices they want, whatever they feel is right, whatever they feel is the appropriate thing to do. Nobody questions them. That guarantees us the independence. Dr. Yeah, I've faced a similar situation when you started. So a couple of uh, points. So one is definitely leadership support. Their leadership when we are working with them, they need to show the value of the coaching organization. That is one factor. Then, you know, right, how teams should work. They expect things from the top. And the second one is, we are a neutral organization. We are unbiased. So when they have a conflict, this coaching organization is really helping them to sort out those things. So that, you know, it's a journey. That creates some trust between the teams and coaching organization. If you look at the results today, we have in our portfolio, we have 9 to 10 people leaders. Good that have been invited for most of them. So we maintain our credibility. We go with our roles and responsibilities. We always look our boundaries. We try to help whenever they need. Sorry, go ahead. So you should give a very special respect in your position. Yeah. So, uh, and you want to put your vision on your coach. So what are we prepared for the future of the RA presentation about the parameters that Great question, right? Um, so a few things. One is 360 degree review, which is we will talk to the stakeholders. So let's say that somebody on my team uh, is coaching somebody on your team, or they are actually scrum masters for your team, coach for your team. I would come to you and ask you, how are things going? What are your feelings about this? Are you feeling comfortable with this person? Is it working out for you? What are, what are the improvements you 
you've seen as a result of this person's impro you know, involvement, then of course it's not a one-sided story, right? I'll go to my coach and ask him or her, what benefits have you seen with this team? What improvements have you made to this team? Also, what improvements do you want to make to this team but are not happening because of pushback? So it's both ways. And so I'll give you some examples. Uh, in one case, we reported a defect density drop, quite a bit of drop in defect density. It was a direct attribution to the coach helping them focus on the right things to do. Uh, re reduction in WIP, work in progress, which is the biggest enemy of getting things done, is your high WIP, right? The more work you have in progress, the less you get done. So that's one thing we coach people on, reduce it. Third, coaching product owners to take more effective decisions and to introduce the idea of value in their stories. Give it value points, just random, just like story points are made up, make up value points. What do you think is, why is it higher value than this, right? So that forces people to make the right decisions. So do, do you create standards for across your company? Do you create spaces for the value, everything on the top? Yes, now, yeah. And, and they're all of them. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly how. We don't treat them the same, right? Some, some coaches work in particularly challenging teams. Their level is totally different. And so we judge them differently. There are some teams that, there are some people that work in established teams. There, the problem is the status quo. Status quo is the biggest enemy. Next to WIP, status quo is the biggest enemy. They're always happy to rest on their laurels. Yeah, we've done this. We can coast for a few months. That months turned into years and decades, right? So that's the other thing. How much are you challenging the status quo? What, what have you made them question about things that they're working on? So it's the effectiveness that they've introduced, the process effectiveness, the, the technology effectiveness, and the product owner's effectiveness, which is the most critical aspect, right? If you, if you have effective product owners, you actually get effective products. There's always subjectivity to everything you do. Uh, I would like to add two more points here. Uh, one is we as a coaches, we have our own OKR. Each quarter we'll have our own OKR, which is aligning the strategy. If I'm working one line of business with the business leader and I'll take the priorities, we'll write our own OKR. That's one of the quantity measures. And as a team, what we do, we connect topics across the organization to get the sentiment how things are happening. Even though if, if you're working as one team, your team might not open with you directly as a scrum master, but these anonymous surveys are really helping us to know the sentiment. Most of the times, people say retrospectives are not working in their survey. So that's one of the objective for us to improve as a coaching organization. Sorry, good question. Uh, you talk about the great mindset change. So the problem we just talked about I phase is you know, the unlearning of bad things. Yes. How did you overcome that unlearning part? Because I don't think it's a new organization. Yes. Uh, this goes to the uh, WIFM concept. WIFM is what's in it for me, right? Uh, to, to a large extent, humans are selfish. Uh, much, as may they, much as people may say, oh, I value working in this organization or I love this organization, they really love themselves. <laughs> so what's in it for me is the main concept they have to understand is here's the benefit you will derive by doing this. Here's your personal objective that you will gain by doing this. And if you resist, there's a pretty good chance that you will not succeed in this new environment. We want you to succeed in this new environment. We'll help you. Here are the tools and techniques, and here's the framework we want to offer you. We'll train you, we'll coach you, we'll mentor you. Whatever you need to succeed, we'll do it for you. But here's the benefit you'll get by doing this. So carrot and stick approach is the worst approach ever. Nobody responds to that well. And those may work for physical tasks. They don't work for cognitive tasks. And this work is all cognitive tasks. So this has to be all carrots. It, there cannot be any sticks there. If you produce sticks, you'll get the opposite result. It'll be counter, counterproductive. So we produce, we only, display carrot type approaches. Here's what you benefit, here's how you gain. It's all about gain, it's all about improving, it's all about growth. I'm not gonna say this is gonna work for everybody. M many people don't really respond either way, but a good majority of people see through that. If they see others succeeding, that infects them. Hey, if this person can do it, I can do it too, right? So it's, it's a little bit of a viral thing. It's also motivating them to do the right thing. So it's, it's a combination of things. Unlearning is never fully done. You can never unlearn something fully, it's not possible. Uh, but it's about forgetting it <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> and, and a similar challenge in our draft framework, it's a 36 months program, right? We, we did not expect to change people in one month. Still we are kind of people, but to understand their challenges, are they really getting capacity to learn some things? Because they are busy with their daily tasks, right? So what we are implementing, we have given some good capacity for them to 
learn these concepts and practice. Let's receive the leadership support. You have guilds, bi-weekly guilds. And if you look at uh, the capacity also, the development capacity can go to four to five hours, depends on the project. The rest of capacity is available for them to explore things. We can't expect people, every time we can't expect people to go home and read about SVP, right? They should be part of the team. So we trust people started giving time, but there are some different people, you know, you know, right? <laughs> Um, I think I've covered in the, but yeah, I'm happy to cover again, which I love it always. So, like others, we started, and all was good. I mean, I'm happy to call it as a doing part, but still, mindset issues, right? So, again, we don't want to blame the teams. We went to the roots and understand. Agile may work very well if you have self-sufficient, like-minded, all those people in a team. But we went to the roots. Basically, if you look at some of the teams, are not even teams because they're completely dispersed and they don't know where the business. So what we understood, first, let's create a prerequisite model which really helps team to start their agile journey, right? That's not a simple model. Leadership involvement. Leaders has to come and you know, they have to do assessment and all those things. Then we decided, let's create one model to cater people needs, right? There is a lot of pre-work when you start your agile journey in after hiring a local people and creating opportunities locally. First, create a standard teams where they can pick the agile values. We want a team. That's what we started. But how did my question work? What was, why did you, what got into thinking yes, we need something like a prep and not being implemented in the technique? Because you long, long back. But after going through that journey, when, at what point in time, uh, you realized yes, we need a program like this? Uh, great, great question. I, um, so, one of the things I want to answer to that question is, um, we recognize that our offshore people, India, Bangalore, wasn't used well. They're supremely talented, intelligent people, but we're not making the best use of them. At the time, we had a, a VP, a his name was Andy James, and he and I had this conversation about you know what are some things that we could do. So I wrote up a little um, framework type thing, and then we had a conversation with some of the key people, both globally and in India, about what are your challenges, what are your So we had them all do a presentation to us. And in the presentation, the root problem came out to be disconnects between product management and development. Well, the location, time difference, cultures, and all that. So we identified these are the core problems. Then um, my boss and I, Andy and I, we, I'm based out of Houston. So he and I flew down to, to uh, Bangalore, spent some time with the teams, understood what was really going on, what we would do. Out of that emerged his vision, which was called Updraft. That was the core idea behind it. And that's what we've been leading down from now on. Yeah. That does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.